So hello everyone, it's the Cricket Connoisseur here and welcome to episode 5 of the TCC Talks podcast. Now today I'm joined by someone who will be very familiar to any Hampshire, England or Perth Scorchers fans out there. It is none other than England's former opening batsman, Michael Carberry. So first things first, Michael, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. How's your day going so far, mate? Yeah, hi, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, um, well, it's um, unusual times. Um, yeah, yeah sun, but sun shining, we're safe, most importantly. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a bit, you know, bit of a bit of a drag these last two months, I'm sure for everybody. But um, as I said, the most important thing is that we 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 do the right thing and you know we um, we stay safe. So yeah, it's been trying to do really. Yeah, that's all we can do at the moment, as long as you're, you're keeping mentally and physically well. I mean, yeah, that's all you really can do at the moment, unfortunately. So, yeah. Michael, to start off this podcast, I thought we'd rewind it all the way back to the start, okay? Your childhood. <laughs> How long you got? <laughs> <laughs> the long book. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. What was your first ever memory of cricket, either playing it or watching cricket? Um, I think it started really as a, as a toddler. Um, my dad was a clean, a keen club cricketer uh, back in South London where I grew up, and um, he actually was one of the founders of a sort of found uh, a wandering cr- cricket club in uh, in Wandsworth called um, called Castletonians. So basically, we didn't have a, a ground, so we used to go around every Sunday or most Sundays, going around playing other other teams at their ground, and it was really formed by guys my dad used to work with on the, on the on sort of in the transport and and various other places they used to drink at this pub called the castle in 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 sort of Wandsworth and that's obviously how the how the club was formed and um believe it or not it's actually produced some very very good cricketers some some county cricketers some some international players um along its way it's still going now still going strong my dad's now uh, i think uh, vice president there now so he's working his way up um but yeah, that was my early memories, uh, going along, watching Dad play. And the guys uh, saw some talent there and would be throwing balls at me from very, very early. Um, and that was sort of my first introduction to what cricket was. And then I was lucky as well that my mum is a very, very uh, keen cricket fan. So she was she grew up in Barbados and used to go and watch test matches as a schoolgirl. So I was very lucky that I had two parents that both loved the game of cricket. And um, yeah, so you really start from there. And then around about age nine, I think um, you get these pamphlets of stuff to do with your um, kids in the, in the six week holidays. And um, you saw that there was a Surrey were um, having a camp um, at a local school just around the corner from where I grew up. And um, it was for a week, um, a gentleman called Brian Ruby, who was running it for the week and uh, just went along and ended up becoming cricket of the week so um that was where i think things started to get a little bit more formal i was introduced to now formal organized cricket for my age group so um i didn't have a club i didn't know where to start even looking for a club to be honest um i used to borrow my dad's gears which was like 10 times the size of me and um and yeah so we we got invited along to surrey trials and again, I didn't really know what I was walking into because um, I'd never been to a trial. But, um, you know, everyone there seemed to have all the latest gear and um, it was at quite nice private schools. Uh, we had to drive all the way out to Guildford most, uh, most Thursday evenings. And, you know, you, you get formal coaching. So, you, you know, you get taught the, the, the sort of fundamentals of the game. Um, and then in the summer, um, we play matches against um, boys of our own age group but at, at different... Um, Different, different, different counties, obviously. So that was that's where it, I suppose the the story really began in those early days. Well, yeah, very interesting start. I mean, as you said, both your parents are massive cricket fans. Like that's always a brilliant thing to have. They obviously must have been really encouraging. <laughs> so back then, Michael, who are your biggest inspirations in cricket? Like, who did you look up to in terms of your batting style? Because your batting style is very old school, wasn't it, really? So who were your <laughs> idols growing up? Who did you for the uh, mould your game off of? Um, yeah, I, I think at that time we're talking, you know, mid eight, mid eighties, late eighties. Um, had to be severe in it, really. Yes. I mean, he he was the he was the man, still is for me. Um, I just, yeah, it was just something about this guy walking out to bat. He just, he just for me transcended the game to a to a completely different level. And um, 
yeah, I, I just I just love watching him play. Um, being a left hander, I suppose the other ones were like, something like David Gower. Um, were, were early influences. I love his grace, very graceful player. Um, and as, as I got got more into cricket, um, it was the obvious one was BC Lara. Um, yes, good choice. Being, left, being being left handed um, and it, aggressive. Um, Ricky Ponting would be another another one I would throw in there as well. You know, very good on the pull shot. I was very good on the pull shot. Um, but I love Ricky's um, intent. You know, he just he just little man, but very very. You know, he looked ten times bigger at the crease. So, yeah, I generally I generally used to watch like very attacking players, and, and I suppose it it's, it bled into how I played. Really, I like I like to be attacking. Um, I was always more excited by watching the guys who, as I say, could take the game to the next level. And um, and I suppose you know there's there's heroes that not necessarily in cricket books. I mean, I'll say my mum was again a hero, a massive influence and hero of mine, and really instilled that like that early work ethic. You know, like having to work hard. And there wasn't a lot of opportunity where, particularly guys like me, grew up. You know, um, I just didn't really know much about how to get into cricket. Um, where the various cricket clubs were based, um, you know, it, it, growing up in South London at the time, there was a lot of crime and a lot of, you know, a lot of social issues um, between my community and the police in particular. So it, it was really the focus on trying to make something of yourself. And my mum was brilliant in that regard of, you know, instilling me, instilling in me quite early that you know anything you want to make a success of, you, you know, you've got to work hard, you've got to put. Uh, the work in the hours in the practice um, to, to be successful. Yeah, great advice for any young cricketers as well, that definitely. Put the hours in, put the work in. I mean, you mentioned Viv Richards. Your impression of Viv Richards, one of the greatest Ashes moments, I think, ever in terms of just hilarity. How did you At nail that? I've been in that series. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you, you scored 281 runs as well, but I mean, ha- yeah. you absolutely nailed that. It was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I was, I was always. I think I was always a child. Like I always. I mean, that's still now. Really, I think that's how I. I, I best learn. You know, I've worked that out as as time's gone on. That I'm, I'm someone that I'm a very keen. When I watch you do something, I'm more likely to pick it up than be sitting there reading lines and lines of text. You know, so that's what you know. That's what I did as a as a child growing up. I, you know, my dad had a, a when he had. When I tell you, he had the biggest collection of it was vhrs back then you know, so you know how long we're going back yep. um and bait and bait maxes yep. um of just cricket you know we, we we would tape you know ball by ball um cricket matches particularly england west indies was obviously the big one in my house and i would just sit there and just study these guys gordon greenwich desmond haynes richie richardson obviously viv and i'll just sit and just watch and just try and emulate what I saw, you know, be throwing balls against mum's cupboards and trying to place it between the vases and, and ornaments. Occasionally smash one, but don't tell her that. Um, yeah, but, you know, that was, you know, being a, you know, growing up as a, as a single child, particularly, you have to make your own play. You have to learn to be creative. And I, I just think I had that kind of brain where I was able to, you know, watch and emulate and 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 see things and i think actually actually through my professional cricket career it helped me understand things like anticipation you know so being a being a bit of a badger and, and studying people's techniques you know you, you sort of know as a fielder where you should be positioning yourself in the field so you know someone like a brian lara with a very high pickup you know you know a lot of balls could bullet pass you know bullet past you on one side or the other so you know you start to position yourself in the field and those kind of things so actually I think it actually helped me a lot yeah I mean yeah great great um great era that as well as you mentioned Haynes Greenwich Richards brilliant brilliant era for cricket especially West Indian cricket so moving on slightly now uh Michael you've got obviously you played your your young cricket youth cricket then you make the step up to county cricket you play for your home county of Surrey how did it feel to make your your debut for Surrey? Oh, it was um, it was amazing. Um, I think amazing on a few fronts because, I mean, the team we had. I mean, going back, I mean, it was it was just stuff of legends. Really, it was like walking in Man City, wasn't it? Like you know, you had 
Butcher, Ward, Rampakash, Thorpe, Stewart, uh, the Hollyoaks, uh, Tudor, Sack Lane, Bicknell, Benjamin. You know, it was, it was just a plethora of international gluttony, <laughs> I'll call it. Um, but the great, the greatest time of my career to learn the game and watch the very, very best at their craft. I mean, I forgot to mention another boyhood era, which was Graham Thorpe. Um, again, I think we're very, very similar in the way we played and the areas we played. And that year I made my debut for Surrey. Um, I was, you know, Keith Medlicott, he was the coach then, um, actually put me and Graham together to practice together. So I was um, obviously massively excited. Um, you know, I'd never formally met Graham Thorpe, but, and he was brilliant for three or four weeks he was around before he disappeared off for England and really spent a lot of time with me and, you know, just gave me an insight in, into what it took to be a successful, not only first class player, but also a successful international player. And I just, I was just like a sponge. I mean, times were very different back then. You know, you were a youngster in such a big stuff, you know, it was very much, you were seen, but not heard, you know, you didn't talk a lot. And I, I was quite a quiet kid. So, you know, you just, you just sat and listened and, and took it all in and, um, yeah, when I eventually got the call up to come and make my debut against Leicester, um, I remember I'd, I'd probably replayed this game probably about 10 times the night before. You know, I was up shadow batting and what I'll do my first ball, when we'll score and this, this and this. And um, in the end, I didn't actually pick my bat up until the back end of day two because they racked up about 600. Um, and, and I did nearly 200 overs of fielding. So welcome to first class cricket. And... Um, yeah, it was those first few years were really tough. I'll be honest, um, tough because you know opportunities were so few and far between. I mean, I had very good players behind me. Remember, um, in the second team, so like for Scott Newman, Gareth Batty, Gary Butcher, um, brother of Mark, you know, very good all rounder. Um, we had you know, Tim Murters, people like that. You know, there, there was there wasn't a lot of opportunity, but we we were very good cricketers. Ricky Clark, you know, again, someone who was coming through at the time. So competition was was high it was fierce and you know that you were there because obviously you've gone in the second team and you've, you've got a truckload of runs and you've earned your place there but similarly you know that if you mess up there's always someone on your back waiting to yeah waiting to step in so so I think it was this is where you learn the game I guess and, and learn you know how to deal with the emotional ups and downs um you know, of, of of a career, really. That's where the career starts. Um, you're under more scrutiny as well. Um, be you know, there's no one, there's no media at second team games. Suddenly you turn up to a first class game. There's you know t cameras, and sometimes you're on TV. And you know, it was a lot to it was a lot to deal with, a lot to take in. And and I think that's why maybe the first couple of years it, it didn't really take off in a way that. Um, I hoped or, or certainly maybe people thought it should, I, sh I should have made coming from quite a successful youth career. But, you know, that's, that's why I say to people, you know, to kids now is that, you know, it's when it's a very different game when you step in the professional ranks, um, different to youth cricket, you know, the, the, the rules of the game are different and it does take some time. And that's why, you know, you have to invest in youngsters um, to, to help them on their journey and make sure that they have all the support they need. Um, in order to fulfil their talent. Yeah, great advice. I mean, we'll talk about your coaching later, Michael, because that is something you've gone into now, obviously, once your time in the game has finished. But you mentioned the, the tough start that you had to your career. So you moved from Surrey, you went to Kent. What yeah. didn't go right for you at Kent? What, what, what went wrong, really? <sighs> well, I think the cold patch system didn't help. <laughs> um, yeah. that, was, um, that was, I think that was really the final nail in the coffin. I think... Um, yeah, it was, it was just a non-entity, really. Um, looking at myself, I'm always, a, you know, a half cricket for myself and what I could have done better at the time. I think, well, look, um, I, I suppose from a, I, I could have, you know, when I had opportunities to make big scores, you know, I'd make a lot of, you know, lovely 50s, 70s, 80s. Um, probably only crossed the, the 100 mark a couple of times for Kent. And I suppose it was that, again, you know, talk about that learning, learning the game and, and learning to be ruthless. Um, I, I probably should have converted more of those 50s and 70s into 100s and maybe the story might have been very different. You, you effectively you pick yourself, don't you? So, um, so yeah, I, I think, again, it's that, that it was another learning phase um, going, going on to my 
to my next county. But you know, look, I enjoyed my time at Kent. It was um, it was a move that was necessary, in my opinion. I mean, again, it, for the times. I mean, players didn't really move around at that time. You know, you generally stayed with the one county. I looked at the Surrey team, and I just was, you know, I was one of four openers. You know, we had, you know, we just had an embarrassment of riches. You know, and you had Scott Newman, who was you know, coming through brilliantly in the second team, you know, scored 100 on debut. Scott, he's a childhood friend of mine. So, you know, it was not begrudging him, of course. But for my own career, I had to think, well, look, there's, there's no way I can sit here for another three or four years waiting for an opportunity. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a move that was necessary. And it was good for my education as a player as well to move out of London as well. It was the first time probably leaving home um, as a young guy at 21, 22 and to, you know, learn to take care of yourself. So I think it had more positive, although I didn't play the amount of games I would have liked to for Kent, it, sort of, it had a positive influence on me as a man. Again, it was more adversity uh, that I had to learn to overcome. And it probably unsubconsciously was adding that steel, that mental steel to my game. So I know that that big thing was going to happen, but it was just a case of when. Yeah, I mean, as you said, it was the it was like the stepping stone almost. And then in two thousand six, the big one comes, doesn't it? Hampshire. Yeah. You get signed by Hampshire. You have Shane Warne as a captain. You have a great coaching staff as well, led by Paul Terry. How big was that move in furthering your career as a player? Uh, well, I think it was massive personally because I think how old was I then? I was twenty five, and it was probably last roll, last last roll of the dice. I'll be honest with you. Um, uh, so I, I, I was I was very lucky that in my last year, Kent, um, I was only really playing one day cricket, T20 cricket, and I managed to get some runs against Hampshire in a sort of lone effort. We 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 got we didn't do very well, but I managed to get get some runs. And um, and I remember a couple of Hampshire guys were very complimentary, and and the coach as well. And they were staggered that I wasn't playing in in all the formats. Um, but. As I said at the time, you know, I was up against you know Martin Van Yarsveld and Justin Kemp and, and Andrew Hall and, and various others that had been, you know, shipped over here by the new coach Graham Ford. So it was it was virtually a close shot. Um, so the move to Hampshire, um, I, I think partly luck as well. Um, we had some contractual things to sort out with Kent, which they weren't really playing ball or playing nicely about. Um, they, they obviously still wanted to keep me there. I didn't see much point. And so the, 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 the severance took time and it, it didn't really leave me much time for a club, I'll be honest with you. So uh, it was just really by chance that Hampshire was still looking around at that time for an opener. You know, the Rose Bowl was quite a difficult wicket uh, to bat on at that time. Um, and they hadn't really found an opening, an opening pair. So... Obviously, they made the approach. Uh, I was at stable. Yeah, I mean, you know, if I'm going to get an opportunity to play, absolutely. So, and and the thought of playing under someone like Shane Warne, um, and I think KP had joined as well. So that was, again, you know, you, you're playing alongside two two world class players, um, and you've got an iconic captain. So I figured, look, yeah, I mean, why not? Um, so I joined. Um, I bought my first property down here as well. I still live down here as well so um so it was I took on quite a lot um I don't I don't know why I felt it would work out but you know I suppose you just have that that good feel vibe that it would um and then I don't know I don't know I, I think something mentally I was just ready you know like I just I walked in the club every, everything felt very family-like at the time um you know people there were very nice very accommodating very very welcoming um loved the boys you know everyone was very 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 nice and I think the one thing I loved about playing under Shane Warne um, was he was just very, very encouraging and very generous with his time. So he always, he saw something in me probably from Nets, Nets or, or first few early matches. Um, and he would, you know, he would take me aside and we would have some talks on the balcony and, and just talk cricket and, and I would be able to pick his brain. And it was great. It was the greatest two years of my life. And I still credit him to a lot of the success I had as a cricketer going forwards, particularly getting to play for England a couple of years later and, and all the success that I, I achieved at the club because I think in those first initial, that first initial season going into season two, um, 
he didn't always go well. Remember, you know, yes, the stats were very good, but you know, I had some games where I missed out and didn't do very well. And I suppose what you become accustomed to is the guy being dropped all the time. Whereas he was now a captain, showing you that no, actually, mate, you're fine. Don't worry, you're going good. You know, um, the big thing for me was being capped in my first year. I was capped after six games. And um, it made me feel like I belonged. You know, I'd, I'd done my done my apprenticeship, so to speak. Um, yeah, yeah, it was a long apprenticeship. Um, you know, you start to think from '98, and you finally have that breakthrough season in not till 2006. So it was, you can see, it was a long, a long period of time. A lot of frustrating days. Sat there as a young cricketer wondering, Am I good enough? Will I ever? Will I ever get that back in? Will I, you know, will I be able to? handle the pressure, break through and, and achieve. Um, so it was it was a massive move. Um, probably had I not made it, look, it might have been very different. We'd have probably been out of the game in the next year or two altogether. Wow. I mean, fortunately, it did pay off though. And as yeah. you just you alluded to there, you made it to the England tour of Bangladesh. We rested Andrew yeah. Strauss. And you made your debut at the Zahor Akma Chowdhury in Chittagong, didn't you? How did yeah, that, did that. How, how did that feel? To make to have gone from as you said, there was eight years of pretty much just on off on off frustrating cricket, and then in 2010 you make your England debut, the ultimate thing that you can really. How did that feel? Yeah, it, it, it was yeah, it was just an incredible three or four years. Um, again, you know, I, I had a decent a couple of decent seasons first up, got picked on the Lions. Uh, when we went to some tough places to tour, you know, India and Bank, we toured Bangladesh in my first A tour, I think it was. And I did well. I got a couple of hundreds, a couple of good scores. Um, went back full of year to India, had a great tour there. And I thought then in 2008, I would have been picked. Um, I got 100 against New Zealand um, at the Rose Bowl. And I thought, you know, Strauss, I think, was struggling for runs at the time. Or, and I thought that was my time then. And... You know, obviously, I didn't finish the season the way I wanted. I ended up getting dropped by Hampshire, so for the first time in two years. So, and um, so that was a, you know, a bit a, again a wake up call just to, you know, stay present. Don't don't take your eye off the ball. Um, you know, until you know the ink is dried, then you know you're going to play. So, you know, I worked incredibly hard the 2008 winter. Um, came back with a bang 2009. Thought I got a chance there, but I then broke my finger. Jonathan Trott got in. Obviously, the rest is history. Yeah. So <laughs> you can see it's 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 just been one of those um, one of those stories. Um, but finally, you know, I I, I did well on, on another A tour, 2009-10, and I remember sitting down with uh, I think it was Jeff Miller at the time. I can't remember who it was, and he said to me, "Look, we're we're going to rest Straussy, and we want you to travel with the team to to Bangladesh." And you can imagine it was a little bit of like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, obviously immensely proud moment. Um, just relief, I guess, to think, oh, finally, you know, I'm, I'm finally going to live that dream of being a, being a test cricketer. Um, I don't, I, I remember finding my mum, she, she, complete, she completely broke down, but you know, it was in a good way. She was so happy uh, around my dad, obviously. And um yeah, it, it was um, it was just a very proud moment for the family because there was a lot of sacrifice that went into getting me there as a youngster. You know, the driving around and, and I suppose trying to raise money for, to get kit and things like that. You know, we weren't the richest of families, um, uh, so we you know we had to make a lot of sacrifices as a family to to help me get there. So it, for me, it was a, a way of saying, look to my parents, look, thanks very much for everything you've helped me do. Um, as well, so yeah. When when we when the plane touched down, it was you know you get to well, not say getting to know your teammates because a lot of guys I would have played against in county cricket, but it's a very different setup, the England setup. And again, you're dealing with more more scrutiny, more more media coverage. Um, and yeah, I, I thought right, you know, I'm I'm just going to try and enjoy myself. Um, uh, while whilst I'm here in the tour, I mean, there wasn't heaps to do in terms of places to go and see when we went when we toured there. So you know, a lot of the time it was time spent at the ground or or in your hotel room, sadly. But um, but yeah, I, I I enjoyed my debut. Unfortunately, I only played the one match um, at, a, at in that series, which we which we won. So that was great. 
um, and I had then had a, a long, a long sort of wait again in the wilderness. Well, yeah, uh, that's what I was going to go on to next because this long wait. I mean, you had this massive high. You played for England. I think you, you did all right, 13, 34 in Chittagong. Not bad scores at all. But then just a few months after, the curveball comes, doesn't it? Okay, so yeah. was it three days before you meant to go to, what was it, Australia 8? Or you get yeah. diagnosed with having life-threatening blood clots in your lungs. How yeah. on earth did you actually find the motivation, inner strength to carry on playing cricket? knowing that, I don't know, a bouncer, a bouncer gone wrong could seriously injure or even kill you at that stage? Yeah, well, I mean, in the, in the lead up to that, to that diagnosis, I mean, I just remember coming back from the tour of Bangladesh, uh, obviously rejoining Hampshire. And obviously, you know, I'm on a real quest now to keep my name in and around the fold, which, which wasn't easy. Um, you know, there was a lot of guys then picked in front of me, which... I wasn't too happy about because I was still having a very good season for Hampshire. I think it was averaging, you know, in the seventies for Hampshire in that in that season, um, and just seemed to be constantly overlooked. But I just remember not not feeling myself. You know, I was feeling very tired, very fatigued. Um, you know, even the most low level of the size, I was I was struggling warm ups. I was really, you know, gasping for air. You can imagine batting out there in the heat, especially as the summer wore on, especially one day cricket. Um, yeah. You know, trying to turn two ones into twos, twos into threes. Um, you know, it was it was quite tough. So it was really during preparation to go back on the NATO. Uh, a good friend of mine, Donna Fraser, uh, was an ex GB athlete. I was doing some some training with her, and I just couldn't do it. I just literally slumped in a corner. I was you know, my heart rate was probably in the two hundreds um, just from having a a warm up jog with her. Um, so I, I knew something wasn't quite right. So I had some tests done and as I say, luckily, because, uh, you know, it could have been very serious, uh, three days before they came back results saying that, yeah, you've got two large clots on your, on your, on, on each lung and they had fragmented. So, um, so they pieces had broken off and there was a couple that were near my arteries and that's why I was feeling breathless and, and was, you know, basically a walking heart attack waiting to happen. So. Um, very very scary time um, I just remember having to admit myself to hospital now for a couple of weeks in Southampton um, and obviously get on the relevant drugs but since then life obviously dramatically changed um, you know it's still a condition I have to manage now um, so you know you have to look after yourself as you say you know you've got to protect yourself from being knocked around and, and that kind of stuff um, but yeah I remember near the time to returning um, I had to sit down with mum my agent in particular I'm very close to and um, decide what the next plan would be um, do I do I call it that do, do I call it stumps there or do I continue and I think it boiled down to and I've always been a great believer that there's there's been athletes in in across every sport that have had conditions you know I think back to like Gary Mabbott who was a Ex Tottenham footballer who was a you know type one diabetic. Um, there's there's been uh, tennis players who are chronic asthmatics, um, you know, and various and various conditions. And I think once they're managed, why not give it a go? Let's see. Um, and also, I think if I was a batsman who played in fear of being hit by the ball, then I think that was the time for me to say, look, that's it's a bridge too far now. I'm done. Let me just, you know, I've hopefully got 50 more years to live on this planet versus, you know, taking a massive punt in the next year or two. So um, it, it just boiled down to that, really. And I just thought, look, let's, you know, God gave me great reflexes. Um, fortunately, up to that point as a batter, I'd never really been hit badly too often, I guess, because that was my shot. It was my area. Um and I, I always back myself, no matter how quickly people bowled. Um, I actually, the, the quicker people bowled, the more I was up for the challenge. That you know, if you look at my record in county cricket in particular, whenever certain teams dominated county cricket, I think back to like Durham, and you know, when they had the the Harmies and the you know Cla uh, Claydens and uh, Graham Onions and Plunkets and these kind of guys, Otis Gibson, who could you know bowl. It was like a test match. And, you know, I remember peeling off a few hundreds against these boys as well. So it showed me that 
I certainly had what what it took in there to to stand up. So I just thought, yeah, look, let me just give it a try. Um, I, I had some great support around me. My my helmet um, my helmet was modified, so I, I went uh, took, went on board with a company called AirTech. So, um, which raised some eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> because of the shape of the helmet, but yep. <laughs> um, but actually for its time, they, they they it was a great a great innovation and something that protected me through a lot of my career. Um, and so uh, I had to modify some of my my protective equipment just to stop me stop the bruising. It was main, mainly the reason. And obviously my physios at the time were you know some great guys. Um, you know, again, lifelong friends because unfortunately they were the ones who were more on edge than me because they had to be constantly looking out for every ball, every, every delivery, every bouncer that was bowled, you know, and that's that net practice as well. You know, remember, you know, it's not, you know, people don't spear you at net practice. So, um, so yeah, it dramatically changed a lot. Um, you know, but I think it, it probably gave me more perspective on life, probably, um, that you could be at the highest of your, your career and everything seems to be flying and going so well. And then, you know, you hit, you hit this and, and what do you do? Do you stay on the canvas or do you, do you get back up and start throwing bats and punches? So that's what I set out to do. I mean, as I said, that is ridiculously inspirational. It really was very courageous. And the fact is you came back from that for Hampshire. I know in 2012, you won the CB40 against yeah. my County Warwickshire in, so, let's sorry, just mate. say yeah yeah the <laughs> catch to dismiss bell i remember that very yeah. clearly um yeah. what was it 244 for seven our final scorecard won by two wickets yeah it wasn't it wasn't a big it wasn't a high scoring game was it um from no. what, because we, we played it was quite late in september the final from what i can remember so the yeah so it, was a, it did a bit early on and then me and vincey i think smacked a few early on and then um, someone got a hundred I think was it someone got a hundred for us I think was it Irvine again got another hundred or something I think like that? it might have been yeah so we, yeah. we yeah we scraped scraped 240 250 or something like that and yeah unfortunately yeah Kabir Ali Neil Carter missed the last ball yeah uh, great take Michael Bates as well great great <laughs> something yeah. let's we talk about that final the best was a Warwickshire no but of course that move that moved on, didn't it? Again, you had a great season yeah. in 2013 with Hampshire. And then you get the call for the 13-14 Ashes. So, going into that series, how did you feel personally going into that series? Were you confident? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I was... Um, yeah, I felt great. I mean, I... I as you say, I... I it, <laughs> again, it, it, as it, it, there always seems to be a pattern with this thing. Um, start 2013, I'll be honest with you, I was even contemplating... Not giving up first class cricket, but you know, just not paying it as much focus. Um, white ball cricket at that stage was going real well. Um, yep. I had a great season in 2012. We'd done the double, as you said. Uh, we were flying 2013. We looked like we were going to do the double double again. Um, and things were really taking off. And I was really starting to focus on white ball cricket. And I think I figured that, you know, I'm, at the time, what, I'm 33. I'm still fit enough. I'm, I'm able to manage the problems that I, I, I had at the time. Um, so uh, I, I was on quickly on this Perth Scorchers radar. So they had made an approach and wanted me to come over and play some BBL that season, which I'd signed the contract and it was, you know, obviously excited. I've never been an overseas player before in my life. Um, so I was looking forward to that really. So mysteriously, I, I got called up for a Lions game, which I was like... <sighs> Really, no. Like, why am I going on the? Line? Yeah, no, not to disrespect it, but you got to you got to see it for what it is from my angle. I mean, I'm 33 years old. Why am I going on the lines? What haven't I proved on the lines at that point? You know, I've played six or seven years of lines, and I've only played one Test match in that time. So, why am I going on another one to prove what? You know, that was my feeling towards it, and I, I think I was right in that opinion. In that opinion, so. I played the game. It was New Zealand again. I got ninety or something like that. Got got runs. Uh, played well, and I just had a frank and honest chat with. I think it was Ashley Giles at the time. Yeah. And I just was fobbed off, really. You know, it was just ECB passing the ball along the line. Um, not no one really wanted to give me a straight answer. And I just said to look to Ashley, look, we both played against each other, Ashley. I'm talking to you as one man to another. I'm not talking to you now as a young player. I'm not a young player. I'm vastly experienced. Look, 
if there's no chance of me playing for England, then look, I think you're better off giving that chance to, you know, you've got other guys coming through the, the system much younger than me who've got to, their thing to prove and are probably going to have a longer career with England anyway. So, um, so he said, oh, look, I think it's worth having a chat with Andy Flower. Um, I, I, I rung Andy Flower and I got really a dismissive sort of tone from Andy Flower saying that we're well, basically we've got better players. So, <laughs> yeah, jog on basically. Uh, so thanks for that, Andy. So um, I just continue on my merry way. I just right, you know, I'm just going to go and enjoy myself, do what, I'm, do what I do week and week. I didn't really give England a second, third or even a fifth thought, you know. <laughs> um, and, and suddenly I was called up for the one-day squad, I think, ODI squad. So I was like, okay, fine. You know, again, made made some runs in one of them. Um, and yeah, felt felt I played okay. Um, so the, the call-up for the Ashes was sort of like, huh? what? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> you know I mean, I had a good Champions League season, but I was like, that doesn't make sense. So I think the fact of probably how I played Mitch in that in that ODI series um, might have been the the sort of final gave me the final nod, so to speak, because he bowled very quickly through that series. I mean, people talk about the Ashes series. I said, let me tell you, he bowled rapid in that one day series. Uh, I thought he broke my shoulder at Cardiff um, with a bouncer. I mean, this thing really just. Um, so yeah, so I was obviously. Very surprised, but again, I was like, "Well, this is great." I mean, you know, to to be part of an action. I mean, this is this is dreams are made of, right? This is what you wake, you know, you you're born as a kid, and this is what you aspire to be as a cricketer, as a yeah, certainly as an Englishman, yeah, for sure. Um, so, um, I, yeah, I just again, I think being much older now by this stage, uh, a lot more mature. I, I, I probably had more command of my game and understood my game and how I did things and how I scored my runs. Stood me in good stead for that series because obviously it was well documented. Things just didn't go very well on and off the field. Um, yep. We had a lot of problems. There was, you know, a lot of in fights. There was, um, you know, the, the, the team. There was no real spirit. There was no team spirit. No camaraderie. It was very much people going off in their own direction. A lot of finger pointing. Um, it, it wasn't it wasn't the most enjoyable tour I've ever been on or bunch I've toured with. I'll be honest. Um, looking looking back now, um, the only thing I enjoyed from it was really the hostility of the cricket, the fact of facing the best fast bowler in the world, which was Mitch and and Ryan Harris. Let's not forget Ryan yeah, Harris, brilliant bowler, yeah, you know, unbelievable bowler. Um, and, and having to take those two guys on pretty much every game, every innings, and and being tested, you know, technique and ticker um, was something. I came back from that series thinking, do you know what? Nothing I do in my cricket life will ever get harder than this, <laughs> um, because they were just on fire. It was it was just relentless, ball after ball over after over, innings after innings, it just kept coming, wave after wave, you know. But that's what I practised for, that's what I prepared for. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that even the years in the wilderness, I never dropped my standards, you know, in, in terms of my preparation. I still, I suppose, yeah, I still did leave the window open slightly that someone might, I might get a recall. So I still trained way and above, you know, the, the sort of first class level I, I trained for facing people like that you know um, and obviously in, in, in the weeks leading up to going to Australia you know I, I you know I was behind the behind closed doors working incredibly hard on my technique and making sure that you know that that work is banked it's invested and now I can just go out and trust it and um, yeah maybe that's probably be why I end up having a, you know, in, in all the carnage actually ended up not having a bad, bad series. Well, as you, well, <laughs> it was, it was a disastrous tour. I think everyone involved and who watched it will, will admit that five nil whitewash Johnson got 37 yeah, wickets. But I mean, as you said, Michael, you did actually, you did stand up to be honest. You got 281 <laughs> runs. You had the third highest average on the team, I believe behind Peterson and Stokes. That 60 mm. at the oval as well. I've laid a pff, gritty knock that, mm. So, 
obviously after that series is finished and all of the fallout, all of the mess that came after it, were you angered when England decided to drop you? Because you didn't have a terrible series. Up until that point, yeah. you've only ever played six test matches. Do you think yeah. they should have given you more opportunity? Yeah. It's yeah. a simple answer. Yeah, I do. Um, I think it was partly because I wasn't prepared to be part of the mudslinging with them and Kevin Peterson. I believe that that had, that had quite a lot to do with it. Um, as I said, at 30, 34, nearly 35, I'm very much my own man. Right, and as you touched upon earlier, my fight in life and the game was far and away different to the ECB. So, mine was staying alive and safe every day. And as and you can imagine, you know, I'm 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 facing all this on medication that I sh shouldn't be really, <laughs> you know, I shouldn't really have been doing that. All right, so you know, my my fight went beyond them and Kevin Peterson and and various others. It was really just coming back safe. Um, uh, as I said, and managing the problems that I had, per the personal problems that I had. So I was angered that, you know, having again gone through all that, um, and like I said, gave a gave a good account of myself, considering, you know, you could see from from the from the from the game that you know there wasn't too many people that were really interested in that series after probably the first test match. So the fact that I kept going even down to my last knock. Um, and, you know, look, yeah, I, I, yes, I would have loved to again turned those starts into, into big scores. But remember, there's no given divine right for you to score runs. You know, it's a test match. It's a, it's a contest. And, and obviously Australia are going to make it as hard for me as possible. Um, I, and I'll say I look back and I think, yeah, I, I, I feel I should have been given a longer run for sure everybody again it comes kind of like the same thing I said earlier everyone needs that backing um, you're not you're not going to be a, a, an overnight success inside five or six test matches um, and it, it, it did annoy me it annoyed it annoyed me from the point of view that I had to go and hunt my reason that's what annoyed me um, look they, they made reference to my age and suddenly my age was a factor <laughs> it wasn't a fact I mean how much have I aged in six months you know it, it was just for me it, it was it was clutching straws I'll be frank I'll be frank and honest it was then clutching straws rather than telling me the real reason as you know my face looked I wasn't part of the big five that were talked about or I wasn't Mr. Popular probably in the dressing room in terms of you know having the bigger Twitter following um, but I'm my own man, you know. If I if I call a spade a spade, if I don't agree with something, I don't agree with it. So, them trying to club Kevin for his behaviour, I wouldn't have a part of it. I said, look, it's got nothing to do with me, um, and Kevin certainly hasn't done anything to me to to make me dislike him. We we we've, all, we've always got on very well. We still get on very well now. Um, so I think because I wasn't prepared to mudsling. I lost my place. Um, but the, the thing that angered me the most was the fact that I had to ring the selectors to get a reason rather than them coming to me. They, they sort of scarpered and then picked another team and left me out of it. Um, and that's what really annoyed me the most. Um, because I, as I said to them, I said, look, it's, it's all well and good when you pick guys, you know, putting your arm around them in the, you know, in the, in the photo. But, your job is also to deliver bad news, yep. right? So yeah, at that stage, look, I know I was definitely sticking my neck on the chopping block because it's a communism. It's not a democracy playing cricket in the, in the ECB. It's a, it's a it's a communism. You speak out, you're gone, right? So I said, look, cool, but maybe I'm paving the way for people coming after me, right? Leave the game in a better place, as they say. Um, and I wanted some more communication for players because. I think these selectors forget that those who did play, what it was like themselves, you know, um, that we, we are all guys out there. We have a very small window in life, you know, maybe 10, 15 years if we're lucky. And we're all busting a gut every day to, to be part of that special group one day to say, I have played cricket for my country. So I think for our efforts, the least we are owed is an explanation if we're being left out or dropped or, or not selected. Um, 
I think that's the job of selectors, not just about delivering the good news and like say, you know, your name is up in lights and these kind of things. It's also sometimes, and I understand it's a difficult job, you might expect some blowback, you might expect some, you know, some some harsh words back from the player, but that's part that's that's the job you take on. Um and I think it's necessary because once all the emotion dies down, you'll find most players, we're all pretty similar. If, we're, if you're honest about your performances, you can, you can kind of sometimes or sometimes see the reasons why you've been left out. Or it speaks for yourself. You know, you average 15 for a series and never pass 50 in the series once. You, you know, you don't, you don't need too much, you know. But it's still nice to have the selector say, look, mate, go away and get some runs and you'll be back. You know, you can't just turn your back on someone. That's, that's not good. No, of course. And to be honest, I was talking about this on a live stream the other day, actually. Six matches for me was not enough. Simple as that. Um, for any player. And the treatment of you in particular, you mentioned your age, 33 at the time, was very similar nowadays to Joe Denley's. So if we saw Joe Denley's treatment by the media in the Ashes, for example, they're all talking about his age, can't teach an old dog new tricks, all, all, all that stuff. Yeah, who, and... who comes up with this stuff, though? This is the thing. <laughs> like Simon Hughes was wrote the same thing about me. You can't teach a dog old tricks. Well, I beg to differ because I've seen a lot of sport. I don't know what, what sport Simon Hughes has ever watched, but I've, I, I sit down and watch a variety of sports and it's amazing how guys get better with age. You know? Um, so if he, if he thinks that being 21, 22 is your optimum age, well, I'll say to him, well, you need to, you need to start looking at other sports, mate. I, I, look, I watch things like NBA week on week. LeBron James is just getting better and better. He's yeah. 35 years old. You know, um, before he sadly passed away, Kobe Bryant, you know, 40, 40 and was still the leading scorer in the NBA. You've got Tom Brady, you know, 41, still one of the best quarterbacks in, in the NFL. So what is he talking about? Uh, who writes this stuff? Who, where, where's the research? Show me the research that shows that you cannot teach someone post-35 new tricks. Well, I mean, it's then, I'm, then, I'm, then I'm happy to swallow that as, a, as an opinion because that's all it is, as an opinion. Yeah, definitely. And not only that, you look at Joe Denley now, how he improved in that final game in the Ashes, got the 94 at the Oval, got progressively better in New Zealand and South Africa as well. And it seems that persistence actually started paying off. He is beginning to learn from his mistakes. Yeah. And yeah. It, takes, it, takes, it takes time. Look, you know, of course. It, do, it doesn't, I would say to people, looking back my own experience, it doesn't matter how much first class cricket you play. Right. And, and Joey, again, was a, you know, an ex teammate of mine at Kent, very talented guy, you know, lovely fella. And, it doesn't matter how, and I'm sure if he was sat right next to me, he'd tell you the same thing. It doesn't matter how much first class cricket you play, when you make the step up to test cricket, it is different. It's a different level altogether, right? And it, you know, some people have a meteoric start, like they start very well, and then there's always a comeback, right? There's always a come down, shall I say, right? Where someone someone gets to know their game, people start formulating plans, right? What have you? Can you come back a better version? And some people don't ever do. Right, and then you get some people who some of the world's greatest. I'm thinking back to like Jack Callis, Steve Waugh, who did nothing for 30 test matches. You know, these guys didn't even have a test hundred, and then wind up finishing their career averaging over 50 and with 30 and 40 hundreds respectively. So it just shows you it's that backing you've got to once you identify, you've got to give that guy some backing. You can't just you know, what, it, what really, another thing, sorry to harp on, but one of the no, things that really annoyed me after getting dropped was, okay, you're talking about me being too old to play, and that's fine, no problem. I can't change my age. But then you're, you're picking young openers, Sam Robson, Adam Life. You know, I'm, massive, I'm a massive Adam Life fan. Um, you know, all these young openers who, across my time, I've seen these, well, not kids now, they, you know, they were kids when I started, but, you know, I've seen them develop nicely into good, First class run scorers, solid run scorers, and they got the same treatment. Four test matches, see you later. Four test matches, see you later. It was just wrong. You know, we're now picking, you know, hitters from one day cricket to come and open the batting in test cricket. Rubbish, rubbish. And I, and, that, and those things really incense me as well. Um, but yeah, it, it was yeah, it was it just wasn't it just wasn't a good time then. 
<laughs> no, and as you mentioned, you mentioned Robson live. We had Stoneman, Ali, Open, Compton. It was the opening batsman carousel, and I think that's just a, a sign of the the times, really, wasn't it? We're trying to always replace Andrew Strauss, get a partner for Alistair Cook, and they're never really content with anyone. Um, mm. Yeah, really tough. And as I said, I do think that not just the treatment of you, but as you mentioned, Sam Robson, Lythe, all these guys, playing less than 10 test matches just is not enough. It's not enough to make the step up, in my opinion, either. But yeah. I suppose England now have, I suppose, learned their lessons from that. We look at Rory Burns, for example. Yeah. And yeah, he's gone on. Yeah, I'm, I'm, pl I'm pleased to see that, you know. Yeah. Um, after, after the... You know, and I'm I'm really sad for Jason. It didn't work out. I love Jason as a as a person, um, but you know, look, uh, when you when you go on media as I had to, it was it was a difficult thing for me to do because on one hand I loved I love Jason as a person. You know, we were good mates, and to have to pick apart his technique was tough to do, but it just highlighted that look, opening the batting is a specialist job. Like I would never get the new ball for example, to open a bowling attack. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? Yes, I can bowl, but I wouldn't take the new ball in an attack. So why do they think that you can take makeshift people and do, to do the same job? You know, it, and it was, I, I believe it should have been sackable, what they did to Jason, to be honest, because this young lad, Sibley, and there were, there were other guys in county cricket who were making stats of runs as well who'd been around, you know, Daniel Bell Drummond's been around a long time. There's, you know, there's other young guys out there who, Adam Live, you know, I'm still, I'm still going to fly Adam Live's flag. You know, I still believe, you know, this guy is, he mates, he's a good player. You know, he, you know, he's got a test hundred as well. Yes, he um, does, yeah. But again, I don't know what happened there. He seems to be just, again, one of those guys overlooked. Um, so that what I'm saying is, is whoever you pick, right, stick, you've got to understand the role of opening a batting and that's I think this was the biggest problem is that the selectors did not do not understand what it's like to open in a batting right it's not like batting in the middle order it is the toughest job in any cricket team right you you, you could feel two days two and a half days you've got a sprint off the field within 10 minutes you're back at the wicket to go and bat for another day and a half to get your team out of, out of trouble right and to set up a game right it, you need to understand that if there's a good ball flying around, generally the openers are going to get it, yeah. right? Open, openers generally score in waveforms, right? You're going to have failure, 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 success. Failure, 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 success. That's how it goes, right? You, might, you may get a run where you have some success, 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 but then invariably there's going to be a patch of, of low scores. It's just how it is, and especially in England, it's how it is, right? Um, in other countries, it's probably the best place to bat like in India, get your runs before the spinners come on. Um, so it's people understanding the job and how and and relating. You know, you, you, every all the stats are relative. So Keaton Jennings averaging thirty in a series towards the back end of the summer. Yeah, of course, because it's September and wickets are juicy. You know, so you've got you've got to you've got to make some allowances, but you you know that keep. Do you think Keaton Jennings has what it takes to beat an England and Open? Well, of course it is. You know, and this is where, I, you know, again, this is where I think they got, they got things wrong. So I'm pleased to see now that finally the pennies dropped, that they've identified Burns to, and I still believe that, I don't think he was one of those guys really on their radar because he probably doesn't, doesn't look sexy enough as, an, as a bat. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, I'll, I'll say it. I'll say it. I'm not, I'm not scared of anyone. I'll, I'll say it. I don't think Roy Burns was necessarily first on their list. Um, but if you look at batsmen who've been consistent for the last four to five years, well, certainly Burns is right up there. With, he's, he's got a very, very good record. Um, Dominic Sibley, I would say, is probably the same. These guys have had to, rightly so, they've done it the right way. They have forced their way in by weight of runs, just as I had to do. Right, and I think there isn't enough of that going on. There's not enough players forcing their way in through weight of runs. It's England looking too much at oh well, he looks good in the net. He looks good. He's got a nice cover drive. No one cares about that, mate. It's run scoring. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, as you mentioned, Sibley and Burns probably the most unorthodox England opening duo <laughs> probably ever. Yeah. But I mean, 
it's, it's not really important, is it? They, they churn away runs. Dom Sibley is a wonderful ball sponge. Rory Burns is a very gifted opening batsman as well. I really like those two. I think that's going to be England's opening pair for a number of years, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, the one thing I will say about that, you touched upon that weight of runs. What do you think about county wickets at the moment, Michael? Because obviously it's been talked about pretty much every single year now. Do you think the quality is good enough to produce these good young opening batsmen? No. <laughs> no, is the simple answer. I think um, it's ludicrous what's going on at the moment. Um, we start the season in March. Why? Yeah, who, who's to benefit from that? You're getting guys who bowl under 70 mile an hour getting 50 wickets a season. That is just not right. That is just not cricket. Sorry. Um, you, you, you're then playing a stat load of your games back end of September. Again, where these guys who bowl under 70 mile an hour are, com are commanding the game, basically. It's, it's just wrong for me. It's just not, not proper cricket. I can't see how you're going to develop players for international level um, by playing cricket at that time of year. One or two games, fine, at the back end, because obviously we've got one, uh, one day comps to, to complete. But year on year, players go to PCA meetings and look, come up with ideas of ways that we're playing less cricket at that time of year and certainly not playing in March where wickets, they're basically, it's like rolled mud is the best way yeah. I, would, I would describe it. It's just rolled mud and anyone who can la land the ball on the seam is going to get wickets. You know, a half volley be now becomes becomes a potent delivery to a batsman because it will just nip and seam and before you know it, it's in first slip's pocket. Um, so I, I just think, yeah, all those things have to be looked at looked at in terms of developing young openers uh, who can handle international cricket. You know, where, where's, the, where's facing the pace and bounce going to come from if they're constantly batting on wicket? If they're playing quarter of the games in, in March and April, I, I, I can't, I can't, or half the games even, should I say, yeah. are being played between March and April. Um, and and you and you're then you then got to go and face, you know, the likes of like say Mr. Johnson, Dale Staines, these kind of guys who are setting Rabadas, these kind of guys who are sending it out 150 clicks. It's hardly hardly the right preparation for me. So I think it definitely has to be looked at. How would you personally well improve that then? What would you do in terms of rescheduling, in terms of, I don't know, attracting, as you mentioned, these high caliber players? How would you improve the the county championship setup then? Well, it, we, I think it's a case of what's your what's your priority, you know. So, I understand on one hand, twenty twenty is the money spinner, but if you're trying to develop test cricketers, well, for me, do we do we need to play such a long twenty twenty? Stop tinkering with the twenty twenty. Um, do we need to play as long uh, one day cricket? Uh, the sort of 50, 50 over I'm talking about um, I think why not play the one, the one day stuff at the early part of the season then? and then you can start the championship maybe in May that might be an option um, I think yeah just cutting down the 2020 so maybe do it on a win percentage rather than playing home and away perhaps but I can't see that being done um, look, that, that, unfortunately, that's not my job. But uh, there, there have been. What I'm saying is, these, these are things that players have. I know the, the few meetings I've gone to, that players have put ideas forward, um, in order so that we we actually getting players to bat and bowl on on say flat pitches, but good pitches. So yeah. it's still often. I mean, England will always offer you something as a bowler, right? But it's, it has to be a contest between bat and ball. I mean, there's no way that some of the blokes who are getting 50 and 70 wickets who bowling at the pace that they do, should be, that should be happening. If they go anywhere else in the world, that's never happening. You know, so that's, this is where I think it needs to be looked at. Yeah, I think that's fair as well. I mean, I was mentioning beforehand, it is, it's been for years now. 
averages mm. are going down. It's it's always the debate that comes up at the start of the season as well. And hopefully right. one day they will they will realise the importance of the county championship potentially with the with the um, advent of the test championship. I think that might help. Mm. But um, obviously now, Michael, you retired from cricket, uh, no longer play at the professional level. So yeah. how have you coped to life without cricket? What exactly do you do nowadays? Uh, yeah, it's um, it's different. <laughs> um, yeah, it, um, obviously the exit from cricket wasn't wasn't great. It wasn't nice. Um, spent six very pointless months at Leicester. Again, I'm not a I'm not a yes man. So, you know, your job gets taken. So fine. Um, life after, what's it been like? Um, transition's hard. I'll be honest. Um, it's not easy. I mean, cricket's been a massive part of my life since I was age nine. Um, I think, fortunately for me, what whilst I was playing, and obviously I had the two illnesses, um, I always kept studying, doing stuff, looking at opportunities past playing. Um, so trying to I suppose formulate a sort of plan um, when that day comes. Um, it came a little bit abruptly. Um, so what do I do now? Um, so I, I did my, the, when things folded with Leicester, I went and did my diploma in the city, uh, became a financial trader. So I decided to trade the stock markets, um, or try to, <laughs> in current times. Um, so I've been doing that. I've been out on my own now uh, just over a year. So I've taken on a 50 grand fund for, for a company in London so cutting my teeth on that trying to so trying to battle my way through the markets so that's hopefully what I, would, I see as my sort of breadwinner going forward um, obviously the art is something I took up going through recovery from cancer in 2016 and I mean that was really just a bit of luck I, I met some people at a dinner party and um, they, they own a gallery in their family so they asked me to come and exhibit my work um, in, in 2019 so we, we did some shows in and around the Ashes and, and uh, World Cup which was great um, it's a bit surreal seeing my work up on the wall and people coming to visit but yeah the support was um, was like fantastic I mean a lot of um, a lot of fans turned up um, some of the ex-cricketers came and supported so that was nice and even if they couldn't make it they you know they posted stuff on their pages for me and, and, that, and that was great so um, yeah it's I mean, I suppose it's it's a difficult time because you don't know what life looks like. You can't, you know, basic elementary things like buying a house, for example, you can't go to an underwriter and tell him, well, or, or her, well, this is what I earn month on month, year on year. You know, so you don't, when you, and particularly where you're working for yourself, you don't really know what that looks like. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty. You don't know if you'll be able to meet month's bills because... You know, you're not. You know, you might have a quiet month. You might have a good month, sort of thing. Um, but it's something that I don't try and focus on too much. I think it's again, it's about staying present where you are now. Um, there's a lot of good things that come out of retirement. Is that you're able to spend quality time with the people you love the most and, and friends and family. Um, that wasn't always the case for 20 years. I was always the the uncle who had to disappear. Um, early to go back to Southampton to train or be on a plane somewhere. I missed a lot of birthdays, Christmases, um, through trying to obviously make the grade as a cricketer. So, um, you know, I'm incredibly close to my mum. So, you know, before obviously the pandemic, you know, I was able to really spend that quality time with her, um, especially in London where I was doing a lot of coaching. And I suppose, it, yeah, it, it just gives you a, a different, a, again, another different life perspective. Um, going forward is it's nice to actually put some other skills um, to use other than just going out there with a the bat um, so yeah I'm, I'm not I say I, I said to my mum when I just made that decision to retire that I see this now as being hopefully my most successful period of my life uh, I know cricket I think I lost you. yeah sorry um, I think People will always know me as Michael Carby, the cricketer. But there's a lot of things that get done for you when you're in your top flight sportsman. You know, you don't always see behind the scenes. You know, when you have to go and travel, you know, you're not the one necessarily having to go and sort out flights and, and insurance and these kind of things. And, you know, a lot of things are done for you 
there's a lot of opportunity that opens when you're part of the sporting bubble um, versus when you're now you come out of it and you're on your own. So I think that's an important thing to have in your in your life as well. So um, yeah, so it's it's been so far so good. Um, I think how you how you were as an athlete on top of your game, how you were towards people when you were on top. Um, I've always tried to remain humble, even when things were, were going well and, and when things weren't going so well. So I think it repays you back. Like I said, any ventures that I've gone into, or like say the art, and I mean, the, the response to that was mind blowing, honestly. I, I sit back sometimes and think, you know, this started just at my local coffee shop, just sketching. Never in a million years that I think you know, people would be leaving Hampshire or Birmingham, London, you know, coming to London to come and see what I draw. You know, that's, you know, so you sort of have to pinch yourself sometimes. But um, I think it's, it's more, it goes beyond that is what I'm saying. It's more how you were as a person when you were, compet- when you were competing. So making that time for a fan, signing autographs, giving, giving someone five minutes of your time. Um, I think it, it pays you back. Yeah, great outlook. And it's really good to hear that you're obviously doing well outside of cricket, definitely. So just to wrap this podcast up, Michael, you've been a fantastic guest. Um, I just wanted to ask you one final question, okay? If you could go back and do your whole cricket career again, okay, right from the start, right from the Surrey days, would you change absolutely anything? Well, apart from the obvious, the personal problems, no, I don't think I would because... I think all those, as I said, all those things that happened, all the, all those little bits of adversity I had to I had to go through early on my career, built the man that you see now, I guess, um, and really went massive lengths to helping me achieve the the success because it was a lot of success. You know, it wasn't yeah. all doom and gloom when the Definitely. when the success, yeah, when the success came, you know, it came in in a, in abundance. You know, like the, the three hundred the you know, the, the one-day knocks on TV, the trophies that we won here at Hampshire. You know, all those things were, you know, from spending a lot of time being that young, frustrated cricketer, one always wondering if it would have happened. Um, but I never dropped my head. That's the main, main thing. Again, I credit that to my mum. She's a very positive, positive lady. And she always was encouraging to say, look, you know, you just just got to persevere. You know, persevere, keep believing in yourself and things will happen and and being brave enough to make certain moves when people thought you were crazy you know I remember Keith Medlicott as I say good friend we're good friends now we're still good friends but you know when I told him I was leaving he thought I was going he said are you crazy <laughs> you know <laughs> but you know you can imagine being sat there as a 20 21 year old leaving home going into the unknown I was never scared to go into the unknown um I'm still like that in my life now, you know, as you know, we talked about, you know, being on the, on the medication and returning to play, you know, again, stepping in the unknown. I don't know. There was no yardstick. There was no other cricketer that had my condition. So I had no one to feed off um, in terms of that. So uh, I had to just go for it, I suppose, um, and see what happened. And I actually ended up playing my best cricket. So, yeah, I don't think I would necessarily change anything that 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 happened. Um, maybe one or two small things, um, but everything, you know, all those well, talked the stuff we talked about today all built the bigger story. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? I'm glad you said that, Michael, because your career was good. And as you said, unique circumstances. I think that's what a lot of people, especially after that Ashes series, kind of overlooked. Um, I don't think. Yeah. I don't think there should be any regrets for you. But um, yeah, that's pretty much it from from me for today. But uh, all that's left to say is thank you very much, Michael. It's been a fantastic, fantastic podcast. You've been a great guest. Um, Yeah. And to anyone who's been tuning in, thank you very much for listening, guys. And as always, enjoy the rest of your day.